welcome to the Chelsea Skidmore Show. I am recording this episode uh, at the Comedy Store, and the intro I am recording at home with my baby girl over my shoulder. She's making some noises for you guys, saying what's up. Um, <laughs> she's about seven weeks old. Her name is Gia, and you know, I I don't know. I'm 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 trying to record the intro, and she's crying, so I put her. On my shoulder, I think she just wants to be held. You know, there's a lot of figuring out what does this baby need? What does this baby need from me? How can I help her? She's been fed. She's been changed. Now what? You know, Um, raising a baby. That's what I've been up to. That's why I haven't recorded an episode. And I know that like a bunch of my past episodes were a lot of pregnancy related episodes. Sorry if that's not why you tuned into the podcast. You know, I I got a bunch of sponsors who sent me some baby gear. So I had to have some pregnancy related episodes. So we're over those. Now I'm back to having regular guests on. Uh, My guest today is Richie Stevens. He is an actor and a writer. He just wrote a book called The Gangster's Guide to Sobriety, My Life in the 12 Steps. And he talks about what it was like to be a criminal, a gangster in Ireland. And it's a pretty fun episode, a bunch of crazy stories. I think you guys are going to love it. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I keep going back and forth on like, do I do a birth story episode? But, you know, maybe that's just for the girls on Instagram. Do Do you guys even care? I don't know. The birth was fucking hard. I was in labor for like... 24 hours. It was gnarly. I don't know why some girls pretend it's no big deal for me. I thought it was pretty wild. Um, you know, squeezing a baby out. Ow. I got a tear, a third degree tear and I'm healing. You know, I am still healing seven weeks later. It hurts when I pee. Um, you know, I wasn't stretched out as I thought I was compliment to me, compliment to the chef. Um, And I'm just happy to be recording again. I got a bunch of fun guests coming up and hopefully I could be putting out some episodes every week. And uh, so enjoy this one back and thank you guys so much for listening. Hi, Richie. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, Chelsea. Richie. So I have been seeing you around the comedy store for years. I don't know, like probably like six years I've seen you walking around never knew your story or anything about you and then all of a sudden i see on facebook it says that you're a, a gangster and or that you were Not anymore. that you were and i was blown away and i was with steven my husband who you know mm-hmm. and i was like did you know he was a gangster and he was like no and we we're like what the fuck and we were just tripping we're watching um the offer right now are you watching that yeah, yeah. One of my buddies was in it, Anthony Scordy. Uh, oh, really? He's playing Carlo Gambino. Oh, awesome. I auditioned for a few roles on it, actually. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, um, we're loving it. So we're so, I'm I'm so excited by the uh, gangster world <laughs> right now, <laughs> even though that's Italian and yeah. you're Irish. I've played, I've played <laughs> Italian gangsters before. I, I, I played one on uh, Days of Our Lives. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm probably the only, like, blonde Italian gangster. But there are <laughs> blonde Italians. Yeah, but not really on TV. <laughs> oh, really? I guess so, because it's like the character of like a dark-haired. Yeah, yeah, I got the blue eyes and the blonde hair, but so the role. <laughs> that's so funny, and lo- love an Irish accent. Let's just loving an accent. Well, that's how I talk. <laughs> I know. Do I have an accent? Yeah, you have to me. Like you're just an American accent. Can you do an American accent? Sure, I can. <laughs> no, I don't get to play Irish very much. Like, really? I think I've only played one Irish role in all these years. It was for like a horror thing for for Amazon called Lore. Uh-huh. Yeah. Did you start acting when you moved to LA or I started just before I moved to LA. Like um I started acting when I was like 30. So mm-hmm. so I'm pretty late to it. Um what are you, 34? I mean... No, late 30s. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I started later in life. Like, I, I used to be a carpenter, and then I broke my back in 2011. And How? From a job? Yeah, a construction accident. I was doing a remodel up in San Francisco, and a beam fell down and hit me, and <gasps> you know, the scaffold, and did, broke my back. <laughs> did they give you, like, a worker's comp? <laughs> no, it wasn't very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I basically... After I hurt myself, I started, that's how I got into acting after that, because 
you know, I lost all my money and I was broke and, and I needed a new career. And this girl that I knew, um, she told me I should try modeling. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I was 30 and, and I've been beaten up a lot of times. Like this nose has been broken a few times and bitten. And there's a bitten? big tooth. Yeah. A person <laughs> bit it? Yeah. What? Yeah, that's the funny thing as well. Like the first role I ever got is me like tied to a chair and getting crap beaten out of me. And, I, and I've, I've played that role three different times in three different projects. And um, can you hear me? Just move it closer. Oh, yeah. I'm moving around. Just like so breathe on it. Just like <laughs> suck it, you know? Yeah. Put so, your face in it. Okay. Thank you. That's better? Okay. Yeah, so I've played that role like three times so far in different TV shows and films and stuff. And yeah. It really happened to me in real life. Like, Wait, who bit your nose? Um, <laughs> all the names are changed in the book, but in the book, yeah. he's called Sullivan. I was like 19 or something back in Ireland, and these guys came to my house one night and barged in and basically held me down and put a knife to my throat and beat me to a pulp. And like, they were trying to get information out of me. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to tell them. So they like beat the crap out of me. You know, and then at the very end, they, they bit my face. Oh, my and God. They, Is that because you were fighting back or just like just no, the bite? I, no, they wanted the information. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, tr they're trying to find out where one of my friends lived and I didn't want to tell them. So I, I just took the beating as much as I could. Just put my arms up. and. So they, you're loyal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't want them coming to get my friend. And yeah, it, it, it happened for about a half hour. They just... They were kicking me on the ground and punching me and knife to my throat. And the guy, like, uh, he, he went into the kitchen and came out with a bread knife, a big-ass bread knife. And he just, like, uh, he, he says, now, I'm going to ask you some fucking questions and I want some fucking answers. And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he just beat me to a pulp and put the knife to my throat and, like, forced my neck back against the couch. Like, so it's almost cutting my head off so I couldn't really move. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Were you terrified? Did yeah. you think you were going to die? Eh. I, I don't know. I didn't, didn't think they were going to kill me, but it wasn't fun. I feel like we need to backtrack. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> So how how did you get yourself into this world? Oh, in the very start. Yeah, let's let's start from the beginning. You're you're from Ireland. Mm -hmm. born, born, born and, and raised. raised. Yeah. So I came to came to Ireland like when I was in my early twenties. But uh, when I was a kid, I was like I was kind of shy and quiet. You know, I didn't really. Uh, I I was I was not like I am now. I was like pretty shy and, and withdrawn and. I started drinking when I was about 14 or 15. I, I went to a concert and Beastie Boys and Garbage. Nice. It was it was a pretty fun day. And, and uh, you know, after the concert, I was on the way home and this girl was drinking some beer and she handed me handed me a beer and I was like, drank it. And I was like, wow, this is great. Like, you know, I is, care. Is 14 late for starting drinking in Ireland? Yeah, it's probably common enough. At, le at least when I was growing up, it was. I don't know what yeah. it's like now. I'm gone nearly 20 years, but... But uh, when I was a kid, like that was that was normal enough. Maybe I was a slightly late bloomer. Maybe mm -hmm. thirteen m might have been. But uh, once I started drinking, I was like, "This is great." You know, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. You know, I can relax. You know, it kind of gave me confidence. So once I started drinking, I was doing it all the time, right? And in Ireland, it's eighteen to drink in a bar or a club, mm -hmm. and uh, so. I couldn't get into the clubs, but I wanted to get into the clubs because I wanted to like party with the adults and score with the women and stuff like that. And I used to like sneak into the the clubs. I like climb in the window of the bathroom and stuff like that. I did that for a while, and um, and then eventually I was I, I realized I needed an ID, so I started to make fake IDs. Nice, you know, yeah, yeah. So, so that was my first foray into crime. You know, and, were they good? Yeah, they worked. And yeah. then what happened was. I had a buddy from school and he like wanted to set up a business where we sell them mm -hmm. to other kids. So I was like making IDs for all the kids in the school. And then it just like ballooned. I was like m making them for kids in other schools I had never <laughs> met before. And I was getting like drinking money from them. And, you know, I went to all the bars and all the bartenders knew who I was and what the I ID drank. Guy. And it was, no, they didn't know. I was <laughs> they didn't. just thought I was, I was a young looking 18 year old. Yeah. So like, you know, I became a regular and, and, and then one of the kids got caught and, 
he came to my business partner. My business partner snitched on me, and I got in trouble. I was, I, I was, I got. That was my first time I got in trouble with the cops, and you know, I was only a kid. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I was like, How old were you? Maybe 15, 16, 15. Did you 16. get arrested, or were they just like, well, don't they, do that? Well, they came to my house when I wasn't there, and and then uh, I got home, and my mother was like, the police were here looking for you. I was like, oh fuck, <laughs> and, and and then she says, you have to go in and talk to them. I was like fuck, so I had to go into the police, like, and uh, and um, the cops were like, they, you see, the police in Ireland are called the Garda, right? Garda. Yeah. Or, okay. Or in an Irish accent, the Garda. <laughs> you know, so, I'm loving the uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So like, the IDs had this Garda stamp on them, and uh, the cops thought like either I had stole one from the station or or they, like they didn't know how I was making these, you know. Mm. So I had to go in and. How were you? How'd you get that little stamp? I, well, so basically the way you do it is, you know how like you use an inkjet printer and it comes out and the ink is kind of wet on the paper? Yeah. If you get like a glossy photo, uh-huh. like an old photo, and you print something on top of the shiny surface, it stays wet and you can use that that uh, photo to stamp onto mm. onto the, the, the paper. But mm-hmm. the problem was it was backwards, so you got to print it backwards and then when you stamp it, it's the right way around. Yeah. So, like trying to explain this to the cops and <laughs> uh, they were like, Jesus, huh? Jesus. <laughs> You know, because they they didn't know how how they're the like that's I smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I I was you know I was like oh I'm sorry I won't do it again. I only made a couple for my friends, you know. Mm-hmm. And they, they believed me and they gave me another chance. You had like, a workshop in your basement. <laughs> <laughs> no, I used to make them at home. You know, yeah. my parents would go to, like you know my family aren't criminals. I'm the only one in my family who's ever been in trouble before. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm the black sheep. Yeah, you know. So like they were mortified. You know, mm-hmm. and. uh so I would make them when my parents go to bed. I would just get up and, and uh, you know, make them down the living room and had these lamination sheets and you'd use an iron to, mm-hmm. to seal them. So I, that's, that's how I got started into it. And then it was kind of the same with the drugs. Like later on, I, I, I got into the drugs, uh, first smoking pot and then later ecstasy. And mm-hmm. I was broke, so I used to just like sell them to get my own. And mm-hmm. then, but I always knew loads of people. So I just, it just... It, the things got got away from me like you know in no time I was like sending them all over the country to do really people. like yeah did you um have a website no oh, okay <laughs> this this would have been like uh what year fuck I would have been like I'd say just around 2000, 2001. 2001. So, yeah. so how were you sending them? And how were you like finding the people who oh, no, this were is, buying th- At this point, I was in college. So yeah. like, uh, I was uh, meeting people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one guy would take a few hundred pills to the West Coast and then... St- so you're selling them internationally? No, not internationally, just oh. all over the country. Oh, right, right. Yeah, but, how did you package them? No, I would hand them over. I wouldn't mail them. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Oh. Yeah, if you were mailing them, you still can't get in trouble caught. for this. I feel like the statute of limitations is over. I think I'm okay, but I'm not. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not gonna like tell kids how well, to the, get away with stuff. I'm you know? always interested in how people send things because a friend of mine used to be like a really big weed dealer, and he would take apart things to mail, um, like mm-hmm. the weed and stuff. And I remember one time he took apart like a big old like stereo and like put it inside that, and like that was like his trick. I can tell you exactly how to do it, but I'm not going to tell you on camera because I don't want to like it. I don't want to encourage kids how to do this. I, I don't stuff. have a child following. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, no, that's not what I'm trying to do. You know, okay, like my okay. my story is about someone who stopped committing crimes. Right, I'm not, right, try, right. not trying okay. to like, teach kids. So we have this to have a positive story. We have to have well, a positive, it is a positive spin. story, you know. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to tell you okay. how to get away with no crimes, secrets but, of the trade. Oh, but but I'll tell you, I never snitched on anybody. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing. I and never that's how did. you get your face bitten. Well, I got my face bitten because I wouldn't tell the guy information. That's good. That yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, snitches get stitches, right? They do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and you know, I had a few opportunities to do that when I was in trouble at certain times, and and I could have done it, mm-hmm. but uh, I'll, I'll, if you do that kind of stuff, you always have to look over your shoulder, and and you know, it's mm. not safe for your family. So I mm-hmm. never did that, you know. Like I got caught dealing one time in in, in Ireland, and and um, the cops just said, uh, uh, "We just want the bigger fella. Give us the bigger fella. Yeah, and you won't even go to court." So I was like. 
no, uh, I'm not putting anybody in danger. I'll I'll take my medicine. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then would you repeat back to people like, hey, like I didn't say anything. Like you, you got to know I didn't say anything. Well, then, like, oh, to get then that oh, once they're not getting arrested, <laughs> then oh, I'm cool, you know. Yeah. 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 Then obviously, yeah. What do gangsters in Ireland wear? Do they wear tracksuits? <laughs> the thing is, right, when, when you're involved in <laughs> or that kind of like stuff, that. I didn't even consider myself to be a gangster until, like, people said that I was, like, I was just, I was, it's kind of like if you have buddies who, like, do certain things, you're just friends who happen to be committing crimes. Mm-hmm. I never really considered myself to be a gangster, like... You know, but it's like a there's like a relaxed way of saying it, like almost like as if you were saying it to like a cop, like we're just simply like committing a crime, like there's a softening around it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean, it's kind of like something the media really says, like, and then I guess when I got sober and everything like that, I was like, well, I guess I kind of was, but at Mm -hmm. the time, I wouldn't have said I'm a gangster, you know, right? (laughs) Well, those are the kind of people who are probably like lame and not actually gangster people and people who are trying to be tough i would assume or the people who get caught right right yeah yeah i mean if you're like labeling yourself yeah, that but, but to answer your question like the, the gangsters in ireland just like look like regular dudes mm-hmm. like they don't you know how like in america that like certain ones will wear colors and have like Oh, yeah. Tattoos and mm-hmm. signals and shit like that. Like bloods and crips sort of thing. You know, do any of that kind of crap. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just normal, you know, I guess. So I guess sometimes they wear tracksuits and stuff like that, but it's not like... I know. Where did that whole thing come from? The tracksuit care? I guess you got to... Well, it's because it's easy to run in a tracksuit. Oh, that's so funny. Is that yeah. true? Yeah, it is. <laughs> I wear tracksuits sometimes, but... I'm, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There it is. So where does it grow from there? So you're starting with the IDs, then you're doing the e-pills, and then what's next in well, terms of this little criminal world you're living in? Well, yeah, the the I, I guess by default I started dealing because um, I, I didn't have any money for the drugs, and, and uh, by selling them I was able to get mine for free. And then, it, like, at the start... Like, I was the first one of my friends in college to start doing ecstasy, and then all the other guys started doing them. And they were like, oh, get some for me, get some for me. And then the guy who would get them off is was a guy called Tomo. And uh, so Tomo, Tomo says, Mush, why don't... He calls everybody Mush. He, so he says, Mush, why don't you get, like, 100 for yourself, and then you can sell some of them, and then you can make a few, a few quid, like... And I was like, no, no, that's dealing. Like, you know, I, I'm I'm only a user. Like, if dealing, you get in trouble. Did you have the double stacked happy faces? <laughs> uh, I'm trying to remember what I used to take when I was in high school. My first one was a 007. Mm. And there was Mitsubishis. And, oh, I remember Mitsubishis. Yeah, there was all those kind of ones. And, but, uh, oh, yeah. that's so funny. <laughs> I'm sure there were probably a different formula from when you got in America. Yeah. You know, but, but uh, so I was like, no, I don't want to be a dealer. And Thomas says, Mush, you're already dealing them. I was <laughs> like, no, I'm not. I'm doing them for free. I'm getting them as a favor. Mm-hmm. And he says, Mush, if the cops get you, the charges for sale or supply. So you're already dealing them. You're just, you're doing it for free. If you're doing it, you might as well make a few quid. Mm-hmm. So I was like, yeah, you're right. Fuck it. I am doing it for free. And if they do catch me, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble. Like, you know, so that's kind of how it started. And one thing led to another. And, you know, Fast forward, I eventually got to America. You know, I got married really young. I had kids. Moved to San Francisco, and when I came when I came to America, I was I was good for a few years. You know, like I was just more of a user than than a mm-hmm. criminal. But then, what ra- what made you go to San Francisco from that's, Ireland? That's where my ex wife was from. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I came over for a summer, and that's how we met, and we we had a long distance relationship, and I went over and back, and mm-hmm. eventually. And she moved over to America, and I kind of thought like Ireland was the problem too. Like maybe if I if I if I got out of Ireland, maybe things would be better. But you know, it follows. Ireland wasn't the problem. <laughs> yeah, was the problem. Yeah, and then I think around recession time, two thousand and nine, mm-hmm. things got tight again because there was no, you know, there was there was no work. I was a carpenter. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, at that stage, I had a huge coke habit mm-hmm. and uh, I couldn't really afford to be dealing coke, seeing as I wasn't working a whole lot. Mm. And um, 
So I decided to get into dealing again, mm-hmm. just the same way by default. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, I was like selling, I was getting these ounces of Coke from- What were you cutting it with? I wasn't cutting it. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I was getting these ounces of Coke off an Irish guy for like 800 bucks. And so how do you connect with like, how do you find like the Irish connections in America? A lot of times you work with them, you know? Oh, okay. Like in San Francisco, I shouldn't say too much, but- <laughs> In San Francisco, there's like a group of Asians who like cater to the Irish community. We mm. say, okay, um, there's one chick actually who who has been doing it for a lot of years. Like, and you call her up and she'll say, "Hey, honey, what you want?" And uh, <laughs> if you want Coke, you say you want a pizza. Okay, want, yeah, yeah. If you yeah. want pills, you say you want candy. Mm-hmm. I used to get it off for you. You meet guys in bars, and then they'll they'll give you the number. And, yeah, you know, I was I was doing my own personal stuff like that. But then I was working with this Irish guy who like said he could give me ounces for eight hundred. So I started getting them off him, but it wasn't that good. And if you're if you're like a drug user, you, you want the best stuff. Like, and I, I was getting these ounces, and it was, it was taking a long time to sell them because you know there was better stuff available. And these there was these other Asian gang. And uh, I used to get my own personal stuff off them. It was, like, slightly more cheaper, but mm-hmm. it was, like, pure, like, you know, yeah. fish scale. Like, right, right, like right. uncut, like, rocket fuel. So I was getting my own stuff off these guys, and then I, I had a brainwave. I was like, why don't I get, like, uh, weight off these guys, you know, ounces? Mm-hmm. So the, the main guy, uh, we'll call him Ronald <laughs> for uh-huh. the sake of, sake of uh, names. And uh, so I said... Um, can I start getting uh, ounces off you guys? And he goes, on one condition. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, if you start getting it off us, you can't get it off anybody else. I was mm-hmm. like, why? He said, because we have really good shit, and then if you start selling our mm-hmm. stuff, and then you start selling crap, it'll ruin our reputation. Yeah. I'm like, okay, that's a commitment, but uh, okay. You yeah, know? I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, I get it. So, But he, then he says, he says, there's one other condition. He said, if you ever snitch on us, we'll kill your whole family. <laughs> and I, I was like, wow, okay, well. No, Straight never, face? Uh, yeah, I was like, I, uh, yeah. Was, or, if, or a laugh after. No, I was like, I was like, well, I've never snitched on anybody before, so I'm yeah. not going to start now. And he says, good. If you're ever arrested, just keep your mouth shut and a lawyer will be provided for you. Mm. Yeah, so. And, he, and then he said, if anybody if anybody fucks with you, we'll be up there with machine guns. Ooh. So I was like, uh, okay. Yeah. Kind of getting serious, so. I was working with these guys and, you know, things were getting crazy. I was like doing loads of coke, drinking loads, you know, up to this point, I'd say it was probably 2010 at that point. And I I had tried to commit suicide multiple times, Mm -hmm. like from when I was like 19, you know, like I would, I would do so much drugs that I would just get like, um, uh, like the highs are really high and the lows totally. are really, yeah. really low. Like, <laughs> Been but, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, I was I was a kind of a mess at that stage. And then uh, something happened. I won't go into the specifics, but somebody hurt somebody I cared about, mm. right? And in uh, this world of this underworld, okay. Yeah, yeah, a, a bad guy. And and then I decided I was going to kill this guy. Nice. You know, so so. Uh, <laughs> I first I talked to Ronald and I was like, "Well, you guys put out a hit on this guy," mm-hmm. and uh, he says, "We won't do it for money or or, like, or or for personal reasons. We'll only kill someone who's done it in business, like who's messed us over in business." Mm. So then I had to like try and find a hitman to kill this guy. So how do you go about finding a hitman? Well, <laughs> <laughs> like, where do you start from there? You wake up that day and you're like, oh, well, "All right." In order to, to find a hitman, first you have to think, "Who's good? Who would do it that you know?" Mm-hmm. Get the role so you think, so, yeah, yeah. So I knew a guy that I worked with. He was um, like northern Mexican mafia that I mm-hmm. that I knew. He was a friend of mine, and, and I used to buy coke off him and his brother. And so I rang him up, and and uh, his name was Joe. And I says, uh, "So Joe, can you talk on this line?" And mm-hmm. he, he's like, uh, "He's like, yeah, what's happening?" So I told him the situation. He says, "This guy needs to be whacked. Like, uh, will you do it for money?" You weren't afraid to have a conversation like that over the phone. Well, that's why I asked him, "Can you talk?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> true. Yeah, it was probably pretty stupid, but I was do- <laughs> I was doing a lot of blow at the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Right. You're not really. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so he said, "Yeah, it'll cost five grand." So uh, I was like, "Fuck." This seems cheap. 
yeah, but <laughs> I didn't have five grand. I was like, I'll, yeah. give, I'll give you two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that for two. So was he personally going to do it? Or yeah. he, okay, no. Yeah, he was going to do it, but but he wanted five grand. And I only had yeah. two. Like, and uh, long story short, I, I was going to rob this place to, to get the money, and it ended up not happening. And then he got a DUI. See, that would have been the good movie. Huh? See, that's the movie. You're uh, robbing the guy to get the money. You're robbing someone to get the money for yeah, that's the hit. The, that's in the book. <laughs> we won't go into it right now. But but uh, but anyway, he calls me back a week later, and he got a DUI. So he's like, "Oh, I really need the money. I'll do it for two. Nice. So I was like, well, "Sweet, okay." But he said, uh, "He said I have to get him the gun because you know you have to get a gun to do it because yeah, like and, a clean gun. Yeah. So like uh, he, you know, he wasn't gonna spend." some of the two grand on buying the uh-huh. gun. So and that's so like the bullets can't be traced or something or whatever. Well, basically, if you have a gun, maybe I shouldn't explain this. No, camera. please. <laughs> we have to know. Uh, okay, so <laughs> say if you own a gun and it's yeah. a legal one in your name yeah. or any gun. Yeah. If, if, if the police do a ballistics check on it, they put it under a microscope and say if you kill somebody and they pull the bullet out of the, out of the body. Yeah. They can match up the bullet with that gun because mm-hmm. every time when it moves down the barrel, little dance on the on the on the bullet yeah. as it goes through the gun, so they can oh. match it up exactly. So, okay. So yeah, and I had a gun, but it was a legal one, so you can't mm-hmm. use your own gun. <laughs> you know. So you have to get an illegal gun. Yeah, or just one that's not yours. Yeah. You know? Or one that's not registered. Yeah, or that's just not yours. It's stolen or something. Oh, so then you have to steal the gun. Well, I, I contacted another guy that I knew who might be able to get me a gun. And uh, yeah, and before I like before we got to this point, uh, I had been on a mad bender. Like, yeah. Um, you know, Burning Man. Yeah. I mean, I've never been. I've never been to it, but I sent a lot of drugs there back in, yeah. in the past. But I would never go. It seems so disgusting. It's n- not my vibe. It's not for me either. But No. You know, I can't judge anybody. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, th- I got a call from this guy from Ireland who wanted a uh, half ounce of Coke. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I got an ounce of Coke and I met this dude and I was like, so what do you do? He goes, eh, I do the funerals, you know. He was an undertaker. He was like going to, from Ireland, he was like going to Burning Man and he wanted like half Wait, ounce what's of Coke. an undertaker? Someone who like, Buries corpses. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he was, yeah. He's an actual undertaker. You yeah. Know? So uh, I got this half ounce for the undertaker, and then the other right. half went up my nose. Uh huh. So I was awake for a few days, yeah. like kind of sleepwalking, drinking loads of vodka, and then uh, at this point, I decided to go to my friend's house to to get the gun. So I drive over to the mission. It's like the Hispanic area in San mm-hmm. Francisco. So. I don't really remember a whole lot of the conversation, but but when he saw me, he was like, I'm not giving this fool a gun. Because <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you were so out of it. Yeah, because I think he thought I was going to get caught or something. So yeah. in the end, he was like, no, I, uh, I can't get you the gun. Or he made some excuse anyway. So I was like, fuck it, I couldn't get the gun. And I'm driving back home and uh, driving through the city. And I have my 22 under the seat. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I kept my 22 under the seat. And I had, I had like an ounce of blow in the glove compartment as well. So I'm like driving back, I'm all sweaty, you know, and then the cops started chasing me. No. But, yeah, I was like, saw them in the mirror, and uh, they were right behind me, and uh, they followed me for 20 blocks, and I'm like, I'm like, my Were you heart- driving carefully? As carefully as someone can drive yeah. after being awake for a few days, right. all covered in sweat, everything, and the lights came on, and the siren, and I'm like, fuck, this is it. And then they turned around and went back the other way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they must have got a call or something. Yeah. But uh, I pulled over. I nearly had a heart attack. My heart was coming through my chest. like, And uh, and I was like, I'm not going to kill this fool. Like, fucking, I don't want to go to jail for this shit, you know? And then, like, the, the my original guy, Ronald, from my gang, he, he had, like, tried to convince me not to do it because he had told me he had killed people when he was younger and they, they kind of haunt him and stuff like that, you know? And so I was remembering what he was saying to me and, you know, so I decided I wasn't going to kill the dude and then I decided to go to Australia. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, maybe San Francisco's the problem. Right. I'll go to Australia. Yeah, so... Went to Australia. That didn't work out either. I was there for How like, long, yeah. I was there for like three or four months, like you know. But I wouldn't have got on anywhere. So what did you do when you get, got there? Just partied. I did lots of fighting and you know, messing around with women and and building houses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
I was involved in some scams over there and stuff. What kind well. of scams? Uh, <laughs> so there was at the time there was this thing in Australia where they um the Australian government would pay you to update your house mm-hmm. for environmental reasons, mm-hmm. okay? So if you have old insulation in your house, take it out and you put in new stuff mm-hmm. and um yeah, so basically what you do is you get your bills of insulation, you go to the house and you go up into the attic and you tap around on the on the joists up there, and pretend you're changing around and just leave the shit in there. Cuz <laughs> cuz it, it was like it was 120 degrees there in the summer. Yeah. Nobody's going to go up to check that shit. Right. So uh, I was doing that and, excuse me, other other stuff as well, you know, trying to get TVs on finance and not pay for them. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. And lots of fighting and drinking and misbehaving. And long story short, I missed the kids as mm-hmm. well. And, and mm-hmm. I decided to come back and give it another shot with, with, my, with my missus. Like, and then fast forward, like a couple of months later, I'm like, suicidal again and you know I, I was going to kill myself and I decided not to and uh, you know I was I was a drug, drug addict but I was a good enough carpenter I always, I always could get work <laughs> and uh, I used to work with these sober guys up in San Francisco they were Irish sober guys and they didn't you know they didn't make any secret of it that they were sober and one of the guys uh, Bernard or in an American accent Bernard <laughs> so yeah. yeah but we said Bernard you know. <laughs> But uh, this guy, Bernard, he gave me his number and he says, if you ever want to get sober, give me a call. So I had this guy's number and I knew I wanted to kill myself. And, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to stop drinking and doing drugs. And uh, I would be like driving home from work and I could feel myself wanting to go to the bar. Mm. Like I was a bar drinker mm-hmm. because I knew alcoholics drink at home, so I would never drink at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to be an alcoholic. It's like, no, that's alcoholic shit. <laughs> so uh, I would I'd be driving home from work and I could feel myself being pulled to go to the bar, even though I didn't want what to. What kind go. of bars did you like to go to? Like a dive bar? Dive bar, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Know. My spot Love was, a good dive bar. My spot was the hockey haven. You know, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was a great dive bar up in San Francisco, but they never played hockey, but that was my spot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I could feel myself wanting to go to the hockey haven. I decided to call Bernard. And, uh, you know, I rang him up and I was like, uh, hey, Bernard. He said, well, Richie, how's it going? I said, hey, Bernard, I think of a problem with the drink and the drugs. Will, will you take me to a meeting? Mm-hmm. And he goes, I'll pick you up this evening. Mm. And and he brought me, he like, he brought me to a meeting. And mm-hmm. that's, that's how I, I started going first. And, and uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, I just stayed sober ever since then and did it, all the shit that he told me to do and and uh, it's been nearly 12 years now. Oh, really? It has mm-hmm. been 12? That's amazing. Almost, yeah, yeah. 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 So then, I don't know about you, but for me in early sobriety, or not in early, for a couple of years still, I was still dipping my toe into living a double life and being really shady and it took a while. I actually probably after I relapsed after three years, like, and then came back in, I was like, oh, maybe I just wasn't emotionally sober that, you know what I mean? Like it still takes a while to get your shit together. So after being involved in this whole world, like how long did it take to shake that in your sobriety? Well, I, I pretty much got it straight away, but there was like loose ends to tie up uh, yeah. in terms of, you know, I'm part of this Asian gang and, you know. Uh, yeah. How do you pull away from that world? So I had to call up Ronald and, and tell him because like I'm taking an ounce of blow every week. That's 28 grams, you know. So so mm-hmm. uh, Because you're still having to do that, right? Well, no, because so basically when I came to the meetings, you know, I, I realized straight away shit the way I'm living is wrong Mm -hmm. you know this shit is not right I can't be sober and continue selling drugs to people you know I kind of it was one thing when I was taking them too but when I was sober I was kind of like nah I'm giving people the tools to destroy themselves like Mm -hmm. so I don't want I I didn't want to do that so then I had to tell the boys that uh you know your favorite Irish dealer isn't (laughs) isn't uh isn't going to be taking any more stuff off you so I rang him up and uh I said, hey, uh, Ronald, um, you know, I'm sober now, so so uh, I'm not going to be able to take this off you anymore, you know. And then he said he wanted to meet me. 
I was like, fuck, what? you know. <laughs> yeah. Because he usually never wanted to meet me, right. you know. So he told me to come and meet him on a Saturday. And I didn't know if I was going to get one in the back of the head or not. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I had never done anything bad to them. You but know? you knew too much. No, but like, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I knew. The, I, I'm, you know, I was working with them. So so uh, I didn't know what, what was going to happen. And Where do you meet? Do you meet by the docks? Do you meet? <laughs> I'm like trying to paint it. Well, I, I, at the time I used to drive a white pickup truck. And uh, I'm not going to tell Unmarked? You. Well, it had a little <laughs> Irish sticker on the back bumper. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, because it was a pickup truck. But but uh, I'm not going to tell you what he drives. But, but uh, well, that's where, been years ago. Where, where does the mafia want to meet when they're meeting someone in person? Well, he he just wanted to meet in my neighborhood. It, like, oh. he told me to come to a certain street. And, and uh, I just sat there waiting in my truck. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then he got in. And I was I was like didn't know what was going to happen and on the radio the, our Oasis was playing mm-hmm. you know Champagne Supernova <laughs> was actually playing and the thing when he hopped in and uh, and he, he goes oh I'm all about Oasis <laughs> and that's what he actually said that's I was so like, funny I was like because I'm I'm at this moment where I don't know if I'm going to get shot in the back of the head or not like because that would be the time that it would happen he'd get in someone would you know but uh, and then I kind of calmed down a little bit when I seen he was legit. But he just wanted to look me in the eye and see that I was telling the truth, you know, because when you're dealing with drug addicts, they're not very honest people. So he just wanted to see if I was for real about being sober and all that. And, and uh, so I reiterated what I had told him on the phone. And he said he looked at me and he goes, you know what, you're a good guy. Um, and if you have a problem, you're doing the right thing. Mm. And I, so I was like, okay, thanks. I appreciate that. You've always been cool with me. And then, uh, and then he offered to buy my customers off me. Nice. <laughs> yeah, he was like, he was like, uh, can I buy your customers off you? And I'm like, you can have them. Oh. <laughs> I was like, I didn't want any money from him, you know. And uh, and he goes, no, no, I want, I want to pay you for them. I think that'll be right. And I was like, no, no, I don't want anything. I, I really want to be out of it. He goes, no, you don't have to see anything. You don't have to touch anything. I give you residual income every week if you just pass on the people. I, I was tempted by that, but but at the same time, I was like, uh, no, you know. That's hard to turn that down. Well, it was more harder for me to, uh, to I guess, to upset him in a way. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't upsetting him. He was just trying to keep me somehow mm-hmm. involved. But uh, Yeah, because you're still linked then. Yeah, exactly. And they, I think they know what they're doing when they do that, too. Yeah, he was a really sharp guy. He was an investment yeah. banker back then as well, like, you know. Like these guys were organized crime. They weren't mm-hmm. dumbass. It's organized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so I just said, no, you can have them. You know, I don't want anything, but thank you anyway. So, so I agreed to like pass on my customers, but like pretty much all of them were too scared to meet them. Like, mm-hmm. I think maybe one or two did. Like, you know. But but the the funny thing was after I got sober and I started going to the meetings, they're like, okay, what we're. I'm like, how do you get sober? So, so I was doing all the things that they, they suggested to me, and they were like, oh, you should try and help other people get sober. And like, some of my customers like were nearly as were even some of them were even worse than me in terms of the mm-hmm. addiction. Like, there was one guy, um, he worked for the city of San Francisco, and he he was one of my neighbors actually, and he was a really good dude. But before I got sober, when I would be bringing him the coke. I used to see him and I'd be like, this fucking guy is a problem. And I'd be like, yeah. I, I would be like, like I had a problem too, but I was like, it's like, you want to, you, you want to fucking cop yourself on or I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you any shit anymore. Like, you know, mm-hmm. so he was like top of my list, you know? So, so, uh, he, he goes, Hey Richie, you got any Coke? And I was like, come over. So I came over, but I didn't really have any Coke cause I was finished at that point. So I came in like, and he was, he was like, where's the Coke? I was like, there's these meetings you can go to and if you go you don't have to take drugs no more and uh, do you want to come with me and he looked at me like as if I was crazy he was like that's so funny I was like yeah and he goes I don't have a problem I was like what he he goes no he thought it was extreme he was like no you you go to your meetings (laughs) so (laughs) you tried (laughs) I I tried yeah but it's I thought I kind of figured like uh, I had found the solution that I was looking for for a long time and I kind of thought like, oh, maybe other people would like to. But then I, I realized, you know, just because I want to be sober doesn't mean everybody wants to be, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah, that was that was kind of strange. But, yeah, that was that was the main way of getting out of it. And, you know, part of being sober, you have to make amends to people you've heard and stuff like that. I did that stuff, too. And, 
you know, you know, you've been to the meeting. Yeah, it was um, what I thought was the craziest thing about making the amends is the people who I was like, like, you know, the ones that felt like the little amends ended up being the bigger deal amends. Mm -hmm. Like the people who I was like, oh, I'm going to apologize to, um, you know, like my old roommates from college because I was like a really crazy roommate and like I was in a crazy relationship and i definitely have to make amends to them because i was like crying and Mm. psychotic every day and causing a lot of drama and they were like oh my god thank you so much like i'm so proud and i was like whoa and Mm -hmm. it seemed like it had such a bigger effect on the people who i didn't think would um yeah and it's funny i like made a financial amends to my dad Uh and i didn't want to Mm. And I was like, I used to steal money out of your wallet. Like, do you want me to pay you back? He's like, sure. I was like, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I made an amends to my dad for being a stripper because oh, wow. he found out. And like, that was like a huge deal and so uncomfortable to have to sit across from him mm. and do that. But he knew in it like because one of his friends caught me when I was working and told my dad and like. So just to sit across from him and like apologize for embarrassing him was like a huge deal. I mean, like it's just crazy where amends take you. And um, yeah. but so your dad's friend was at the strip club and saw you there. Yeah. Oh. And I was so fucked up and high on coke, and I was like, "Please don't tell him. Please don't tell him." And he told him, and my dad texted me. This is so sad. You just broke my heart. Oh. And I was so high on coke. I like was like, I was like, put this out of my head, like don't even like think about it you know like when you're so fucked up but i it was like the saddest text to receive yeah um, at like 5 a.m you know uh. <laughs> and then i was like oh well and then I, <laughs> you know i was in such a dark place that i like couldn't even i wouldn't let myself sit with it and i just went on partying but um yeah i know the feeling <laughs> yeah it's yeah so it's 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 great to be able to make amends i mean it's crazy how like some people don't even work all the stuffs, you know so mm-hmm. it's <laughs> <laughs> i needed that it was a bad case yeah, yeah so then you decided to write a book about the gangster's guide to the 12 steps is that the yeah so basically <clears throat> so did i tell you about how i became an actor oh no please get okay. into that well yeah because um that happened for take us on this journey okay so I, after i got sober i was like no more criminal shit you know no more violence no more cheating on the missus n- uh, trying to be a good guy mm-hmm. right and um so things were going great for a while right uh had nearly a year sober and you know i just got my contractor license because I, I wanted to be a contractor and um you know, I, I was doing this remodel on a house and beam fell down and hit me, broke my back, and my back was, like, permanently damaged. Ugh. So I was like, fuck. And I got a bunch of operations on it. How much did that hurt, by the way, when you when you break a back? <laughs> it, it hurt a lot, like, but, but uh, I had, like, one broken disc and one herniated disc. Like, one of my discs was broken in two. I've actually had more painful stuff that, than that. Wow. Yeah, but... Um, I had to get a I had to get a, a tooth removed that was actually more painful than that, Ugh, would yeah. you believe. But yeah, the boys at the meetings they told me like uh, if you get any operations you want to watch the pain meds because mm-hmm. if you take those you can relapse. So, yeah. so I was really careful about that stuff. I never never took any of the pain meds. I kinda toughed it out, but You had to go with the I'd be prof in eight hundreds. I'd be profan <laughs> as like as far as I go, you I know. know. Like uh so so I was like, I, I expected everything was going to be cool once I, I stopped being bad and, you know, w- was sober and then lost my whole livelihood and, and uh, I, I lost all my money. I didn't know, I didn't have a whole lot of money from the dealing anyway, you know, because mm-hmm. I was my own best customer. So, <laughs> right, so, totally. so uh, it wasn't like I was making millions or anything like that. Literally everything I made was spent mm-hmm. every week, you know, so uh all my legit money was gone and, and um, I was at a meeting one time and this girl that I knew like told me I should be a model. Uh, I didn't really believe her but I was open to suggestions because mm-hmm. I had no other options and uh, I, I I got signed to like a small modeling agency and I did a little bit of it and um, there's a website called Model Mayhem. I had my, yeah, had my I remember that. There. Yeah, my photos and uh, this guy contacted me. He was the director hmm. and he was 
doing like a low budget short film and he asked me to be in the movie and he said he was looking for a German gangster and he, he says don't take this the wrong way but you have that look about you you do yeah <laughs> <laughs> I do play Germans a lot but um yeah so so I didn't tell him that I used to be a gangster I didn't yeah. scare him or anything but, <laughs> but uh, so yeah I, I did the role and it was like I told you I was literally tied to a chair getting beaten to a pulp in the thing and I was like I have this inside joke that this shit has really happened to me yeah and uh but it, I guess it telegraphed because it was a good fit for the thing and then I ended up playing that exact same stuff in MacGyver and this other show on Hulu so yeah I, I and I enjoyed the acting way more than the modeling so I was like I want to do this so so I started taking classes and uh, moved to LA a year later so I'm in LA in like nine years now and then the roles just got bigger and you know uh like I speak a lot at meetings people ask me a lot because I have a strange story and you know I'm an Irishman. There's not a whole lot of patties in LA, so they're like, "Oh, he he talks funny. Let's have him speak." Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm like spe speaking at all these meetings, and uh, a lot of people have said to me, "I should write a book." Mm -hmm. And like, I meant to to get around to it, and eventually, I started writing down all my experiences and got them all down on paper, and you know, it was like 105,000 words, which is like 430 pages. Mm. Of, How long of, did that period take when you're writing? I wrote it pretty quick. I wrote it in a couple of months, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and um, every day. Yeah, yeah. Were you very like disciplined? Like, okay, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to work on my book, just from like a writing perspective and discipline. I wrote it on my phone. Oh, you I, did I wrote the whole book on the old phone. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had like I, you know after I became an actor, I did all these broke ass actory jobs for mm -hmm. a little while, and and. Uh, I won't say where where it is, but but uh, I was I'd be at work just writing my book on my phone. Yeah, yeah. So I had I, I had the whole book written out, and um, around the same time, maybe three or four years ago, um, one of my buddies, Sean, he he's another actor who moved down from from the Bay down here with me. We're pretty close friends. He had a comedy project that he he had been working on, and he's he he was willing to make me a producer on it if I if I can get some famous people attached you know so it was a comedy so I reached out to a couple of comedy people tried Danny McBride first and Danny McBride's assistant got back and he said no Danny doesn't take unsolicited materials yeah right and uh and then I I hit up John Altshuler you know because they're he's one of the creators of Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and uh it's one of the best comedies at the time and uh well ever actually and he got back to me and and uh, we met and he was really cool and you know, Sean's project ended up not not going anywhere, but he said, uh, you know, keep sending me stuff. Mm -hmm. So I sent him a couple of other things. He wasn't interested. And then I finished writing the book. So I sent him the book and uh, he said, uh, yeah, this is kind of cool, but uh, I don't really know where it's going. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had like read 50 pages. Mm -hmm. And by that stage, it wasn't obvious that I had become a gangster, like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, so I, I told him and then he said, let's meet again. And we had coffee again, and he had no idea that I used to be a gangster. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not scary. Like, I'm friendly, you know. And so I told him some yarns, and uh, he's like, "Wow, this is this is amazing. Do you want to partner on it?" And I, mm -hmm. I was like, "Yeah, okay." And <laughs> so let me pause for a second. So you're you contacted a writer on like a super popular show. Yeah, I sent him a cold email. He did a cold email. Yeah. How did you keep that relationship continuing? And like, how did you keep it? Like, how did you keep him interested? You know what I mean? Like, well, we like it, it literally happened within two months of meeting him. Mm -hmm. So like, we met that one time, and and he was really cool, and he got on well with me and Sean, and and uh, and he he's a genuinely nice guy, mm -hmm. like, you know, and and. Uh, yeah, it, it like it literally just happened that fast. Yeah, yeah, and then so first. Uh, you know, he has a project that's coming out. I, I'm not allowed to talk about mm -hmm. it, but but basically it's about somebody who is a famous writer and uh, he put us in touch with uh, his book agent. So we sent my original manuscript over to the book agent mm -hmm. and uh, she read it like twice and she's like, this is a crazy story, but I don't know what the hell to do with it. Right, <laughs> yeah. Know? So John came up with the idea of like rewriting the book uh, thematically based on the 12 steps. Mm. So mm -hmm. so we, we, we read the book together, me and him and Dave. Dave is his partner, Dave mm -hmm. Krinsky. 
and uh, and that's how it became the Gangster's Guide to Sobriety, My Life in Twelve Steps, because there's twelve chapters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's like the A storyline of how I how I got sober, and then the B storyline is like flashbacks to all this crazy stuff that happened to me. Mm. Yeah, so so we rewrote the book. And how long did that take? That was a while. Um, probably about. I'd say about a year. Mm -hmm. And then how did you work with them on the rewrites for that? Like, what was that process like? Oh, it was cool. Like, um, uh, we, we just emailed each other back and forth because I think at this stage the pandemic had started and, Mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, it was really cool. They're, they're easy to work with. They're fast, you mm-hmm. know. And but do you do like a Google Doc and you're all looking at the same doc or like what's like the... We do like a Microsoft Word doc uh-huh. and then send it to each other and, and we confer and then the publisher, the publisher put us with an editor as well and we worked with him too. He was great. Uh, mm-hmm. Jacob Hoy is his name for Post Hill. He was, he was a great editor too. So between the four of us, we put it all together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's coming out on May 24th. So then you finish the book and the agent says, this is great. I'm going to sell this. And then the well, writers say... Well, we, we got the book deal before we even had it written. So, okay. So um, we had 14 publishers interested. In, wow. Uh, yeah. Did and, that just like blow your mind? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was pretty crazy. And and, uh, and we went with Post Hill and... and they agreed to do it be- before we even had the manuscript, so mm-hmm. we worked with them on Oh, so on the pitch alone. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. yeah, they're really cool guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. then were you worried at all that anything that you talked about would, like something from your past, would someone would get upset or like... I'm sure some people would be upset. <laughs> yeah, but you change names. Well, yeah, the lawyers yeah. make you change all the names anyway. There was a couple of people who didn't want their names changed. There's a couple of real names in there. Mm-hmm. So some of the some of the gangsters said said they wanted the real names. In there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so yeah, but it's all true, you know. And uh, the names are changed, and and some of the details are changed to protect identity. So. Mm-hmm. I don't have any existent beefs with anybody, so I'm not worried about anything. And now, are you planning on taking the book and trying to make it into a series? Yeah, it's going to be a series. Yeah, um, I can't say too much about it, but uh, there's a lot of people interested in it, and um, you'll hear more about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so cool. So, like, how funny is that? That just, like... Y- y- how everything just kind of like flows along, like sort of like, oh yeah, I'll try that. And <laughs> then it just kind of like all falls together. It took a couple of years. It didn't just happen overnight. But No, was, I yeah, know, but cool I'm saying just like out. keeping like an open attitude and energy with and like flowing with like what's kind of coming in. Like, oh yeah, I'll try that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's cool when things work out for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it really does help if you meet the right people. Like, right. You know, working with John and Dave was, was great. And mm-hmm. I still enjoy working with them. That's so cool. And then how funny is it that you continued to play gangsters in movies so, and TV shows? So is that like, you're like, at this point, I'm just going to do headshots geared towards that kind of role yeah, I was told to do that. Like I, the first acting class I went to, you know, most good acting classes will tell you your type. What's your type? Mm-hmm. It's different in Europe. In Europe, you can, they kind of allow you to play anything. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll see over there people play all kinds of stuff. But in America, they kind of put you in a box. And at the very start in the acting class, they were like, "You're a villain. <laughs> you're, you're you're a bad guy." And I was like, "Okay, could be worse." That's so funny. Yeah. So so um. Yeah, I just I I got headshots taken like that, and you know, all pretty much all the jobs I got was from auditioning. Mm-hmm. You know, didn't get any of them handed to me, so nobody really knew about my past or anything like that. It was just went for the role the same as everybody else, and that's how I booked them. Do you have any crazy audition stories? Hmm. What do you mean, like crazy? Just like, what the fuck did I just do? <laughs> I remember one time in a commercial audition, I I looked down at a fake watch that wasn't on my wrist. You know, like you just do things in the moment. Yeah. And then I was like, why the fuck did I just do that? And then when I left, my friend happened to be the casting director. And she was like, that was psycho. 
And I was like, <laughs> and then the, I spent the whole car ride home looking down at my fake watch, replaying out like, what the fuck did I just do? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I guess <laughs> when, when, when I was new in town, I didn't know how to play it in terms of, so like I'm, I'm an Irishman, but I'm never going for Irish roles. They usually want like people with red hair and freckles. Mm, Irish, mm-hmm. So I'm always up for some other shit. And uh, so it was, I didn't know, you know, when you come into an audition, obviously before pandemic, after, since the pandemic, it's all tapes. There's not really many in person anymore. But like in the, in the old days before the pandemic, you come into the room and you say, hey, how you doing? Uh, uh, you do your slate and then you do your performance. So I didn't know, should I let them know I'm really Irish or just fucking play whatever I'm supposed to be when I go in? And I experimented with different ways. So, like, at the start, I was honest about it. So I go, hey, I'm Richie, how you doing? You know, the Irish accent, and then I do my thing. But I noticed when I do it that way, they're watching me to see how good my accent is instead of the acting. Mm. So I was like, and people told me I should pretend to be American or Mm. whatever the fuck I am as the character so then I started doing that and then I thought it would be cool to like say hi as an American do the role as an American and then afterwards go by the way I'm Irish you know but people get mad about being tricked (laughs) so I noticed like uh, a couple of times people were perturbed by that so 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 then I just like don't tell them I'm Irish and then they figure out afterwards and they go oh he's Irish that's cool but but I don't I don't trick them anymore in the room or, you know. You ever go in acting American, do the audition as Irish, if it's for a character, or like an English character or something, and then you end with American, they're like, he was incredible. Like, he really just like went into that accent. Yeah, so, you know, sometimes, so I, I, I did this TV show called Major Crimes, and um the character was supposed to be from Manchester, but I decided I'd make him Cockney, mm-hmm. you know, because I can do 50 different accents. You can? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Can you uh, spitball through a couple of them? Okay. So Irish ones, you know, I'm Dublin and hot like that. Arnie, that's the story. That's the working class accent from Dublin, you know what I mean? And if you're from Northern Ireland, you say, I'm from Northern Ireland. That's a bottle of water there. Doing a podcast with Chelsea Skidmore at the Comedy Store. And then there's like where I'm from is like really redneck. So like they're like, hey, how's it going there? Are you on the podcast, are you? You and Chelsea Skidmore below in the comedy store. <laughs> That's like where, where I'm from. They kind of sound like that. The rednecks like, but um, yeah, I can do all these accents. So what about English ones? I can do a few different English ones. Like uh, on Major Crimes, I was a Cockney, innit? And then Manchester's like that. Yeah, right, mate. Liverpool is like, hey, how's it going? Chelsea Skidmore podcast. That's a comedy star. And then there's a ton of different ones, you know. I like the Cockney one. <laughs> yeah. So I did the That's co- like the Guy Ritchie one, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah so, so for Major Crimes, that character was supposed to be uh, from Manchester. Mm-hmm. And I just said, fuck it. Like, I'll, I'll make a Cockney just take a shot, even mm-hmm. though the character isn't. And uh, all the other people who were going for it, they were playing it as Manchester because mm-hmm. at the callback... So before pandemic, you have callbacks and you come into the building and you and the other f- four or five finalists. Who look just you, like you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They all go into the room and you take turns and you come out. And I could hear them from inside the room. All the other dudes were doing it as Manchester. So I kept with the Cockney and I came in, I did it. And four or five producers were there and they were like, wow, that was great. And then yeah, I said, thanks. And then they asked me, are you really from London? And then I'm like, no, I'm from Ireland. And then they're like, ah. <laughs> oh no, yeah, they thought it was cool, and then I booked the role. Love it. So, yeah, yeah. It's it's and you know even it, one of the tricks I do. Here's a trick for the actors. So whenever you're doing your slate, so if you're if you're not an actor, when you're doing a tape for an audition, you do the role, and then you do a separate take of saying, "Hi, my name's Richie Stevens. I'm six foot two. Da da da." So that's a slate. So I always do the slate as the character. Mm, mm-hmm. So like, if the character is an evil Russian gangster, mm-hmm. I'll say, my name is Richie Stevens. I am six foot two based in Los Angeles. You know, as well. So sometimes that can give you a little bit of extra. I like that. Yeah, somebody told me that uh, that's a cool thing that I do. Yeah, I love it. 
Thank you so much, Richie, for coming on. So tell us about the book, when it's coming out, where we can find you on social and all that. Thanks very much for having me, uh, Chelsea. It was a lot of fun. So the book's coming out on May 24th, 2022. You'll be able to get it at um, Amazon, Simon & Schuster, Barnes & Noble, uh, Audible. I do the, the, the voice of it as well. And if you guys want to find out any more information about me, you can see it on IMDb and I'm on Instagram as Richie Actor. And uh, if you guys enjoyed this with Chelsea, please like and subscribe. Thank you. Bye.